Welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Anwar Youssef Dunbar, and this is Big Discussions 76, Science and Technology. First of all, please like this video, please share it, and please subscribe to my channel. Well, as you can see, I am back and I have a, uh, a guest. Uh, joining me for this uh, discussion is uh, another scientist, Nicole Ali. Nicole, welcome. Good morning or afternoon. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's afternoon here on the, on the East Coast. I'm good. I'm good. Um, just trying to survive during this, this thing we're in here. Yeah. So, Nicole is, uh, uh, I'm very happy you're here. Uh, I had an, another a previous guest uh, who was from the clinic, uh, but Nicole is a, is a, a scientist um, herself, um, so more, more so in the lab context. Uh, and that's where I got my training. My, my backgrounds are in pharmacology and toxicology. And uh, Nicole is here to uh, talk to us about something um, that I think a lot of people don't know about, uh, which makes this valuable. And it's also something that's out of my realm of expertise. Um, I, I could have easily, you know, did a Google search on, on this topic and tried to piece it together myself. I have some background in molecular uh, biological techniques, but it's, it's so much better to have an expert uh, come on and actually walk us through it. So we're going to talk about something um, called uh, CRISPR. Uh, Nicole, just briefly, do you want to tell us what that is? And we'll, we'll go back to the, into the meat of it in a little bit. What that, yeah, that stands so, for? Um, thank you. Uh, CRISPR, a lot of people will give you a long definition. And the basic definition of CRISPR from an application standpoint is just changing a genetic sequence. That's all you're doing. You're changing the code, the genetic code for any gene, any organism, model or otherwise, and you adding, adding different sequences, taking sequences away, switching sequences, or doing all of the above at once. So CRISPR and many iterations of CRISPR are able to do that. And there are other techniques that you use. So this happens naturally. Um, the technique of CRISPR where you're uh, changing genetic sequence, um, it happens by viral infection sometimes um, through incorporation of those different RNA DNA sequences but we are able to capture what happens in nature and use it in my field specifically use it to reverse or stop the spread of prostate cancer okay so that's the basic of CRISPR okay so just a little a little brief history here um, the first time I heard about CRISPR, it was a couple of years ago, and I just, I don't know, I just happened to find a video on YouTube discussing uh, CRISPR Cas9. And I was interested in it because I was looking for investing ideas. And I was, you know, with my background in pharmacology and toxicology, I was thinking, okay, well, what new um, health and medical innovations are coming that I might be able to throw some money in. And that was the first time that I had heard about it. So busy. I didn't have the chance to sit down and read about it and, and figure out how the thing worked. And then someone we both know and follow started talking about CRISPR over and over and over again. It's about three to four years later. And I said, okay, um, this gentleman, uh, BGS, the master teacher, which yeah. is how you and I uh, basically okay. met, uh, <laughs> yeah. was talking about CRISPR in the context of what's going on now. And that's when I, um, and, and when he saw me set up this channel and he started supporting uh, what I'm doing, and BGS, I appreciate that. Um, I really appreciate that support. I said, okay, well, I started, I started creating some video content on the coronavirus, and that's when your name kind of came up. And uh, he mentioned you, oh, I know what it was. It was whether or not it was man-made or whether or not it was from nature. And that's, I had when, your, yeah, and yeah. that's when your name came up. And um, I, you know, I'm undecided. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a background in it, but I, I, I made a video citing a paper 
arguing that it was from a laboratory or that, or that that was uh, from nature. I'm sorry. Mm, and, and that's when I said, okay, well, that, that's when he and I talked and he said, you might, you might want to talk to uh, Nicole. Mm -hmm. So that's how we met. Yeah. <laughs> and here we are. That's, that's really funny because a lot of things that BGS says, you know, I, in my opinion, brings people together to discuss whether they argue, whether they disagree, like, seriously disagreeing with each other or the topic at hand is still is making us think. And that's something that is very valuable, especially at this time where we discuss things that will affect us directly. Right. So yeah, the, the idea of it, that was the main thing. I had a discussion with him on another stream and he was saying, well, you know, Dr. Anwar, he's going to disagree with you and da da da. And I was like, what? Like, who is this guy? What, is, what yep. are you talking about? And he was like, he was like, no, he's going to disagree because he thinks it's bad man. I was like, hmm. well, we'll so, see. Yeah. So when I heard him say that, I, th I think I heard him say that. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, in science, your, your reputation uh, and your, you know, your, your reputation is everything. So I said, let me go and clarify. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wanted to start the discussion on my channel. I found a paper. Right. The whole thing exploded. And that particular paper suggested that it was um, from nature. But I, I learned so much from him. Um, I'm glad he came back after he went away. And I think this is an important discussion uh, for two reasons. Uh, I think um, we need more scientific discussions in our community and, and we need more scientists like us to, to, to have these discussions so people can see it, uh, yeah. to know that we have these, this, this ability and this, this expertise in our, our community and also, just on the broader societal context, a lot, of, a lot of people don't know what this is in terms, right. of, in terms of CRISPR. So Nicole, before we jump in, jump back into CRISPR, just briefly, um, how did you get involved in science? Oh, that's a long story. Okay. I'll get it down to a little- All right, you can give us, give us the guy version. <laughs> I'll do Reader's Digest. Yes. My mom is a teacher, a science teacher. My father is well, he's veteran, army, and he was mechanical engineering. So those two together <laughs> produced me. But the household I grew up in was science STEM based. My father is still angry because, well, little, because I'm not an engineer. And my mother is like, why didn't you become a teacher? And I was like, okay, I, I'm in the middle somewhere. So scientists, eh, they kind of just let me do my thing. But in doing that, I got to just explore like my childhood. I grew up in the country. I grew up in South Carolina. And so we were always outside. We're always outside playing, always doing something. And my dad let me do basically any little experiment. I had the chemistry set. I didn't lose my eyebrows, but I did burn my fingers. Um, you know, I just trying new things, trying to see what it is you want to do and, and then seeing like, is this bringing value to society? So that was like one main thing that brought me into science. Like, is there altruistic, um, you know, side to what you're doing? Are you helping people? Or are you just doing this because you want to have fun? No, you need to be doing this with structure to help people and sticking to like what it is I like brought me into research because initially I wanted to do med school. I wanted to just be an orthopedic surgeon. And then I was like, oh, sports medicine. They're always getting hurt. So I'll always be employed. <laughs> but then I thought, wait a minute, those student loans are really, really high. And I don't come from a lot of money. And I was like, well, maybe I just need to figure out what I want to do. So in college, high school, college, I started doing internships. I started, which are free that you know you don't have to pay to do them they pay you to work in a lab and learn in the summer so through the ls the lewis stokes uh, amp program i joined that and you know got a lot of help with tutoring got help got able was able to tutor other students was able to go to internships was able to shadow physicians and see what it is i wanted to do and i decided research I just happened to be in a prostate cancer immunology lab. We just happened to be testing a uh, unknown drug at that time. And I was like 19 years old. And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm following protocol and I'm seeing how things work. And fast forward to now, and we have patents, we have publications, we 
just finished clinical trial. It, it was very successful um, with combination therapy, which we then patented. So this is real life now. It's patients who are dying from prostate cancer. And you know, hopefully what we're doing, we can contribute more to the field of science and medicine. So yeah, I mean, from you know, humble, like the old saying, humble beginnings, you, know, you really don't know where that person will end up. And I'm still learning. The main thing to remember of anything else that I say today is that I'm still learning and I hope everyone else you know, continues that, that hunger to continue to learn, learn more. Okay. Uh, just briefly, what part of uh, South Carolina are you from? Upstate, Greenville, South Carolina. Okay. I went to uh, Johnson C. Smith. Wow. University. Okay. Right and I know a lot of <laughs> Charleston. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Charleston. My mother's from Charleston. Charleston. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So which, which biomedical discipline did you settle into? Did you settle into? It sounds like you, you're. Uh, my area, my specific area is genetic engineering. That is my specific area, but I can, since I have formed it into this, this arena, and since I'm in genetic engineering, I can touch a lot of different things, toxicology, pharmacology, um, drug development, discovery, uh, military defense, you know, uh, bioengineering and that, uh, material science. So especially now with a lot of material science that they're doing that's touching into into international defense and stuff like that. Or I can go the other way and teach what I know. So there, there is, it keeps you open, more open for clinical practice. Um, you know, I talked to a surgeon the other day about our trial, like he's still confused about some markers that we discovered from the patients. Mm -hmm. And I have to keep telling them, you know, you have to let this, let the data tell the story. You have to let the data tell, as long as you keep that in mind, let the data tell the story. Don't try to mix it and match. That's the basis of the engineering that we're doing. We're let the data tell us something is wrong. How do we fix it? And you go from there. So that's my specific field. Okay. Yeah. One of the, thing, one of the things I try to communicate uh, is that in the, the biomedical sciences, there's just so much overlap. So you can you know, train in, in a toxicology lab and learn techniques there that can allow you to work in a genetics lab or a physiology lab or, or whatever. So there's just so much, so much overlap. Okay. Well, let's jump back into CRISPR. And I did just a little bit of quick research before we, we logged on here. And something that came up on the page that I went to was gene editing. Yeah. Okay. Can you talk, uh, based upon what you told us at the beginning of this interview and that term, can you kind of. Yeah. So like I said earlier, like gene editing is, um, you're just changing the way that the gene is expressed. And if you change one gene, you're changing other genes you know, probably you are, you probably are changing other genes because it's like a spider web. So if you, if you touch one part of a spider web, then it will, it should affect other parts of the spider web. Even if it does not, it could weaken that portion, that region of that spider web. And if you think of the genome, the human genome, like a spider web, then it works that way. If you cut cut and paste and cut and paste here. Well, you have a patchwork spider web. Now it's more of a quilt than a spider web. It's not going to do its function properly. So if you have a, a cancer cell, for instance, or a leukemia cell, then they require certain gene families to be turned on. And you turn those gene families off, you shut down that portion of the spider web. You just cut a hole in it and it's gone. However, Sometimes you do that and you knock out this family or this master regulator, this master teacher of genes, right? Right here. You just knock that out, which we've done. And the cells learn how to adapt. They're like, wait, you're not going to cut this guy out. And, you know, I'm not going to die. I'm going to survive. I'm going to keep coming back. And after so many generations, maybe hundreds of generations of these cells passaging over and over, that gene expression 
is, is going to be compensated by another gene. Another gene will compensate the loss of that gene family or that one gene. And that one gene could control maybe five or 10 enzymes, but those enzymes are critical to that tumor cell metastasizing from your prostate to the bone. So in that tumor cells processing of, of these genes, those genes are important for my survival and you're not gonna stop me from, from living. Mm -hmm. So the basis of the editing can be, it can of course be used for nefarious purposes. Because just like I gave the example of the spider web and the cancer cell, you can induce this, this physiology. You can induce this pathology that you see. You can in, induce a state where you cannot treat the patient or you cannot treat patient or mouse, mouse in my case, for most part, you cannot treat this, this um, mouse because they've become therapy resistant. You can find out what genes are high when drugs are given and overexpress those genes and edit that gene so that instead of it being expressed, you know, one X, it's expressed a hundred X. Now you can throw any, any kind of drug you want at that cell, that gene's on a hundred times higher than any other cell. And so that's a more nefarious thing. Some people do it that way to retroactively try to study how tumors develop, how diseases develop, how they get worse. Um, others do it for whatever reason they're gonna do it. Uh, for us, it's to reduce tumor spread, reduce metastasis, to target the tumor metabolism, and to um, directly focus on genes that just don't need to be turned on at this time in someone's life. Because if you're 50, 60, 70 years old as a man, you should not be expressing genes that you expressed as a fetus inside of your mother. You understand? Those genes are turning on when they should not, they should have stayed off. And that's what we're trying to knock out. And we've knocked out, we have about four, I have four um, CRISPR knockouts myself that I use. Um, excellent, I mean, they do what they're supposed to do. They prevent the tumors from spreading. And that's, so we can use other drugs. That's the main thing. So in patient, uh, if you wanna translate this to patients, when you knock out these drugs, if, you have to, if they're being treated, you have toxicology, pharmacology, if you're treating them with a certain dosage and you wanna look for patients that have low expression of these genes that you've knocked out. You wanna do a screening. So this is what they would call personalized precision medicine, where they don't, one size doesn't, doesn't fit all. We know that now. Everyone has different experiences, different genetic makeup, different um, lifestyles and whatnot. They come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So you have to have more personalized, free personalized <laughs> precision medicine. And that comes from us doing the work in the lab to say this gene set, this 20 panel of gene, 20 panel of different genes are bad. You want these, if they are high in a patient, this patient is in this classification. If they are low, this patient is a good patient in this classification. Good patient me, to me, meaning they spend less time in the hospital being treated. Uh -huh. They're in and out. That's a good patient. You know, a patient that we have to kind of work on is one that has multiple mutations, multiple polymorphisms. They do not respond to drugs. They do not, uh, their, their tumors, like whatever, it's very heterogeneous. That is a hard patient to deal with. Most patients on trials are hard patients. They have failed everything. So that's how, that's how I would see the gene editing from a bench standpoint into the clinic. Okay. Well, you know, what's interesting about what you said is uh, when I was a postdoc, we were using a lot of um, transgenic and knockout mouse models we were knocking out p450s and i always wondered okay how is the mouse going to live if we take this gene out but as you said the body and the cells have ways of compensating for some in case something like that happens yeah usually sometimes they don't some yeah i mean we've had cases where yeah i chose the wrong gene i knocked it out and the cells died 
you know, and that's a whole month and a half of work that I did and their cells, they died because I have to clone. I have to select clones. I have to do all that. That's six, that's six weeks of work minimum to do. And then they die. They're dead. When I put them in the mouse, the cells die or the mouse dies. I'm like, oh, this didn't. Or transgenic mouse, when you have a knockout mouse. You, you know now, we've learned that if you order that, if you want to have this knockout of this gene, because everything's sequenced now, um, they'll tell you, well, we can't do that mouse because it's lethal. It's a lethal knockout. So what do you want to do? We can give you tissues, but that knockout, you won't have a mouse to do anything with. So they'll tell you up front nowadays. It's a much easier streamlined um, process. Back maybe maybe three or four years ago, it was like, let me just pick and choose what I want. Now you have to be critical on not only what genes you have that you want to look at, but what processes, what function in daily life for a person is this gene going to touch? Because all genes have some function. You know, even intron, intronic sequence have some functionality, but is this going to touch diabetes? Is it going to touch blood pressure, uh, you know, hypoglycemia, is it going to touch, you know, leukemia? How is it affecting a person on the street? That's the main thing. You know, that goes back to the precision medicine that we try to focus on personalized medicine for each person that comes into the clinic or into the, the hospital. Cause we, we talk to them all the time. So, okay. Oh, I want oh, to ask you. Something. Go for it. Oh, as, as a, as a physician, do you have any um, like uh, communications with, with laboratory people and, you know, how does that go for you when you have communications with them about different projects? Oh, well, I'm not a physician. Uh, I, have a, I have a research background uh, mm -hmm. like yourself. And right now I work in uh, regulatory. Oh, you're in compliance. <laughs> Yes. Okay. You're the guy. We're like, uh, ignore this guy. Like, yes. <laughs> ignore so, his email. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I normally don't talk about like my nine yeah. to five here, but it, it has a broad impact on everybody. So uh, as it ha so you have had interactions with laboratory um, personnel and do you see an interaction between laboratory personnel and clinicians? Uh, do you see the positive interactions between them? Well, it depends on the lab. Uh, you know, when I was at Michigan, there was a scientist uh, on the lower level, Dr. Lucchese. He, uh, he was a, uh, a cardiovascular pharmacologist. I believe he was an MD as well. But he was working with the pharmaceutical companies testing their drugs. And I think he was in regular discussions with clinics as well. But I think it, 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 it in large part depends on the lab and the the, um, the partnership created. Right. Yeah. It has to be a certain level of trust there when you're doing the work. Yeah. I noticed like they they will well now it's becoming different because of COVID nineteen. I think it's becoming the environment and the interactions between clinicians and scientists on the lab is becoming. Uh, very humble. They're very humble now. <laughs> They're because and when this all started, the personal story is all when it all started. This was uh, late January, and two physicians came in. You know the, you know their their stethoscope. They're all like, I'm a doctor. That air they have. I'm just like, whatever. Here they go. <laughs> well, you know the the. I'm pipetting and measuring and doing my thing. They asked for equipment from us, from us. They're like, we need, we need your strainers, we, your cell strainers, we need your homogenizers, we need vortexes, we need uh, tips, we need autoclave tubes, only autoclave tubes. We need your, oh, your RNA kit, we need your RNA kit. I'm like, you're not taking, this kit is $1,200. No, you're not taking my kit. Like, no, I literally took it from the top shelf and was like, no, this is, this is ours. You're not taking this. And they're like, well, we have authorization. I was like, okay. Cause then I knew it was over. You know, he had the paperwork <laughs> and he shows it to me and they take, they literally take everything, but they come back and they're like, you know, at some point we will need you all to help us. 
And I was like, wow. So from then until now, I see the interactions becoming, it's a lot better, you know, between physicians and scientists. They're asking a lot of questions, which is good. Okay. Well, you know, the running joke is that the, the clinicians, uh, you know, they, they're totally confused once they get into a, a research setting. So they, you know, they're, they're the bosses in the clinic, but once they go over to the, yeah. the workbench, it's, uh, yeah. it's not quite the same thing. That's, that's sometimes true. Some of them is, is not, not always true um, because a lot of them have, well, one, one, a lot of them, their spouses are scientists. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Another is they started as scientists, some of them, and decided, you know, they went the opposite of me. They were like, I'm going to med school. Forget this science stuff. I'm not doing it. You know, so they, they do have a, they do have an appreciation for the science. But yeah, like some of them, they're just like, whatever. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Okay, then why is it that we need to explain these biomarkers to you that you got in your trial or you got in this project? Why do you not know what this biomarker does? I don't care about biomarkers. I care about the patients. The patients are expressing the biomarkers. Like, how could you not, you know? And they, they, they see, like, uh, everything's concrete. It has to be right here. You know, as far as having the imagination, we have to put, you know, do elaborate PowerPoints and, you know, beautiful pictures and video for them to really capture what we already see in our mind. It's just a different, different way of thinking about what's really going on. Okay. And that's how I see it different way of thinking. So with the gene editing, mm -hmm. you're basically turning basically genes on and off or you're, you're upregulating some and downregulating some. That's big, basically it for the lay person. Yes. Okay. All of that. And so there's a, uh, there's an obvious clinical uh, benefit to doing something like that, assuming it's, done correctly and it's not uh, lethal for the for the patient mm -hmm. uh, but um, are there potential dangers to this new technique and technology yeah the the definitely potential dangers um, like I said earlier like if you if you over we have overexpression of a gene so um, we have androgen receptor which will control prostate growth but also prostate cancer growth. And androgen receptor naturally mutates, amplifies itself. It auto-regulates. So we decided, well, if we overexpress that, those variants, those mutations of androgen receptor in a cell that no one cares about, which is the, the fibroblasts or the stromal cells or immune cells mm -hmm. that are surrounding the prostate, cancer tumor and helping it to grow, then what happens to the tumor itself, the epithelial cell type that is within the prostate that makes up the prostate gland itself. And we found that you have increased, if you overexpress one gene, one gene in this one cell type, you have increased of neuroendocrine differentiation. So when cells have more neuroendocrine differentiation, they are less likely to respond to drugs. Those neuroendocrine genes are very high in presenting prostate cancer patients, the ones that present at Gleason score seven or higher or at stage three or higher. They have high neuroendocrine differentiation. These tumors are expressing genes that, like I said earlier, were expressed when you were a baby inside your mother's womb. Mm -hmm. They are not supposed to be on. If you take it the other way and we overexpress that same, that same gene in a liver cell, you can kill a person if you overexpress that same gene in a liver cell because that mutation of androgen receptor is not supposed to be on that high in every cell type. So it is, it's cell-specific. It's clearly going to become patient, more patient-specific. There are dangers to using this technology, there is a technology called gene drives where you begin to regulate generation uh, genetics. You're looking at population genetics and evolutionary genetics as well because you're using 
um, model systems like Drosophila or, or fruit fly or mouse, or um, for instance, even a, um, what is a C. elegans, and you're changing their, these are ancient <laughs> genetic sequences that you're, you're messing with, you're changing. You can change metabolism was one of the main ones that they that they look at um, focusing on because of course everyone's fat, so they're like, hey, let's start <laughs> let's start mixing up the metabolism. But metabolism has another thing that's very important when it comes to uh, more advanced species such as humans and primates is metabolism with fat or metabolism with sugar is very important to manipulate or study because we require fat for brain development and functions. Mm -hmm. The island sheath of the brain it is required. You require a certain amount of fat to process vitamin, certain vitamins and minerals. So if you start messing around with metabolism, thinking, oh, we're just gonna make everyone, everyone skinny. Okay, but if you're skinny and dead, or skinny and not very smart, then how is that, how is that helpful? So there are, there are a lot of dangers where um, the gene drives also involves timing um, efficiency with how you program the gene to do what you want it to do. So with ours, it's immediate. It's not time released. It's not based on development. It's not inducible by what you're eating and drinking, for instance. Mm -hmm. It is immediate effect, immediate, well, in six weeks for a cell that's uh, it's kind of immediate because you can see what's happening three days and then six weeks later, it should still be there, right? So for us, that's immediate. Three days is immediate in a cell, cell culture. Um, a week is immediate for a mouse. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, so there are a lot of, again, there are a lot of clinical applications for this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think something that BGS was touching on was that this could be used in other arenas such yeah. i mean can this be used to create viral particles yes uh yeah you it, well you're using viral particles to manipulate human or mammalian cells okay so yeah if you can use viral particles because the crispr cas9 uh, cassette it's a viral cassette that you're using and there are lentiviral cassettes that's a virus that you're putting into a animal cell. You need to grow that virus in bacteria. Use the bacteria to grow the virus, kill the bacteria, take out the viral DNA or RNA, whatever you prefer, and use the same kit they're using to process um, the coronavirus right now, the MIDI kit or the mini kit, and use that to get your quantities of DNA and RNA, put that into a human cell, put that into animal primate cell, frog cell, whatever cell you're growing on plastic. Once you have that incorporated in, you put that cell in a mouse or a rabbit or a dog. So if you do that, any of those steps can go wrong. If you do it wrong, you could have devastating effects. Yes. Depending on how the virus is packaged, how it's designed, um, how you, uh, how the, the virus is proliferating, which bacteria you use to proliferate it, you can make a mistake at any step. And the viral packaging is not something that is, um, it's not cut and dry, as people think. You know, sometimes people make mistakes. Sometimes people mislabel. You miss, simple mislabeling happens. You label the unknown virus a control and vice versa and wonder why nothing's working. You're like, why is my control killing everything? Well, that's actually your real virus. You just mislabel couple weeks ago. You pre-labeled your tubes and came in and you weren't paying attention and you grabbed the wrong tube. Simple. Simple mistakes. Okay. They happen all the time. And so for the layperson, uh, the context for cassette, does that mean there's a, a specific package of genes that have been incorporated in that virus that they want to deliver? Yes. They have to be the proper sequence. One, two, three, four, one A, two A, three B, like that. And not only do they do need to be in a package, like you're saying, um, the sequence has to be right and you have to have the right um, number and type of restriction enzymes because you're going to have to restrict where you either express this virus or expand this virus. Like which way do you want to go? You can express it 
You can have an express, expression plasmid that you're using with your Cas9 cassette, or you can have an expansion um, uh, plasmid that you're doing with your cassette. Some are thermogenic and some are, some are oncogenic. Thermogenic, temperature dependent. Mm -hmm. Oncogenic, they are gene dependent. It has to be a certain gene there that's turned on before this plasmid does what it's supposed to do. You can also have some that are, um, they are uh, drug dependent. You add a drug, you give a drug in the water for the mice or a drug in the media for the cells. And when they take in this drug, the gene is turned on. That could be, of okay. course, so as various purposes. I don't recall if we said this at the beginning, but the acronym, once again, everyone, the acronym stands for, and cor correct me if I'm wrong, clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats? Yes. Okay, that's a mouthful. Yeah, yeah, CRISPR is easier. And so, so, and so cassette, so CAS refers to cassette. Yes. Okay. And the nine yeah. refers to the number of genes or a specific? No, the, the nine is just the version of CRISPR Cas that they have. You have a Cas um, um, virus or a Cas plasmid that you're using. And this is your cassette that you're using. I mean, you have many other types of cassettes that you can use, viral plasmids, vectors, uh, bacterial vectors that you use to get in a message, to get in a gene um, sequence, whatever that is, whatever you want to do. And so they have, there's nine, nine is the most popular. It's probably the older, oldest one. I mean, there's 12A, 13A, there's different versions of this. And as you go, it just becomes more efficient. So the time to infect reduces, the higher the number, the lower the time it takes to infect the cell or animal with that, with that virus that you're using. Okay. 